it's a huge pleasure then to this end for me to introduce this panel with these two really excellent dynamic scholar activists uh, who I'll introduce uh, now. Um, Lonnie Hensler from the Institute for uh, Ecosystem and Sustainability Research at UNAM, uh, the Autonomous University in Mexico City. Uh, Lonnie is a, a doctoral researcher on participatory methods and conflict processes, uh, working also with a number of uh, CSOs, including our, our really exciting partner, Umbella. Um, and uh, Dylan McGarry from Rhodes University in Makanda in South Africa is a senior researcher at the Environmental Learning Research Center there and a leading figure in developing important new uh, movements around transgressive learning. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from Lonnie and, and Dylan. Uh, I should introduce myself as well. I'm Andy Sterling from the STEP Center at uh, University of Sussex in the UK. So the menu for this uh, plenary session is the three five minute introductory talks by Lonnie and Dylan and I about what our experience is on the pressures and the possibilities, which I know will come to sharing through the meeting as a whole among everyone. What have we learned about the ethics and the politics and the pressures for co-opting these processes? No matter what we may intend, they can be co-opted by privilege and by power. So what can we do then practically to resist this and uh, make ourselves as effective as possible as part of these wider movements. And um, yeah, I'll kick off with a few thoughts of my own on uh, these methods for transformation, just to uh, uh, try and uh, yeah say a few words about my own limited experience on this and, and, and out of the step center. Um, I'd say, a good starting point for me is that there's a habit in academia and actually um, far more widely of taking for granted whatever is most familiar. That's a problem at the best of times, but when we're actually talking and it's a big responsibility to be talking about progressive transformation, that taking for granted is at, that it's most problematic. So when it comes to disciplinary research for sustainability, what this means I think is taking for granted several really serious fallacies, um, which are kept in place by their convenience, both for privileged academic cultures, for whom these fallacies are actually you know, very expedient, and powerful policy interests out there. So what do I mean then by those uh, fallacies? Well, the first one is a fiction that action is always best based on knowledge, more than knowledge based on action. Um, and of course, the reason the idea is out there that it's always emphasizing action uh, needing to be based on knowledge is because this is very convenient. It's convenient to academics, to disciplines, to the conceit that uh, academia is very important in these processes of transformation. We need to come up with a knowledge which then forms a basis for onward action by other actors. But it also plays to policymaking interests whose major, the major commodity in a lot of politics is to hide behind something. So that if things go wrong, you don't get the blame to justify policies, which you are, of course, working very hard behind the scenes to shape, but you want to be able to pass the buck. And that, and we can help that inadvertently as academics, even as critical, critical academics, by supporting this idea that action always has to be based on knowledge. So especially for transformation, uh, it needs knowledge as action. Knowledge is action, new kinds of knowledge, challenging new understandings, as well as action first in order to shape uh, new kinds of knowledge. The second fiction that I wanna highlight is that spaces can actually be created which are free from wider power and privilege. Of course, efforts to do that where we can are extremely important, but where these turn from aims, which are really never fulfilled into claims, if we, are, if we allow ourselves to be pressurized, even if not making the claims ourselves, have others make those claims on our behalf, that we've somehow created a space free from power and privilege, then we can become move from part of the solution to part of the problem, I think. Because rather than aiming or claiming neutrality, progressive research of the kind I know there's such a rich basis in this meeting, um, has to be framed not just as being indifferent to power, but as part of struggles against power. And this isn't because power is somehow labeled as always bad, because it's very complex, of course, and it comes in many, many different forms, but because power is most sure to become bad, to become regressive, if it is not challenged. And then the third 
of these fictions I just wanted to throw into the mix uh, at this stage to get us going, maybe by disagreement as much as anything else, is that these idioms that are, of course, rightly really emphasised in our work of engagement, of dialogue, of participation, are not always necessarily progressive. Um, they, of course, can be so, but only when particular con conditions are fulfilled, um, where, for instance, prevailing power and privilege are being actively challenged, not just a neutral space made, where participation is as much about the design of the process, not merely conducted within a process that's designed somewhere else, and where the involvement in the process of, 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 uh, of of activist research, if you like, is not just for those who are invited, but also for uninvited interests, for those marginalized voices who can miss being invited even by people with progressive intentions. And then my last uh, little pebble to throw in the pond is that the fiction, again, that research for transformation must effectively, if it's gonna be effective, prescribe single policy actions we must somehow just say what to do in a singular way. And even if this is only accidental, this kind of idea can really reinforce that justification process. That's what power wants. It wants the idea that there's a policy cockpit when there is in fact no cockpit. There is no cockpit and pretense that there is one, even innocent ones, even by criticizing the cockpit in that way can be really uh, problematic. So I, I think research for transformation instead should far more often aim to open up rather than close down the space of possibilities, helping to catalyze and inform and provoke political spaces, not just inform policy, but political spaces where marginalized interests can represent themselves. No matter how much effort we may have gone to, there will always be other voices that have just been missed out. So it's by opening up, I think, that we can be more resistant to capture and where we can recognize that transformation, if we're to do it justice, is much more about catalyzing politics than it is about just informing policy, albeit there's a role for both, but if we're to take transformation seriously, we need to do much more of the politics. So that's it really for what it's worth. It's a bit prosaic. Action uh, is at least as important as knowledge in our, in our, in our efforts, even where we consider ourselves researchers. Um, aim not to be neutral, but actively to challenge power, that the process should be for uninvited voices as much as uh, uh, the invited uh, views, and we should end by not trying to prescribe solutions, but open up a space for others to bring theirs. So, uh, yeah, I don't know what we all make of that. We can have a little uh, sort of uh, bat these things around. But, um, yeah, Aloni, I don't know if you want to just kick us off with some thoughts of that kind. Of course. Thank you very much for the invitation and also for the, uh, well, this interesting thoughts I would love to discuss on. Um, well, I would like to share with you that my path of learning about participatory processes has been highly inspired from participatory action research, not that much from transdisciplinary research. And um, for those who do not know, participatory action research is a Latin American ethical and political approach to action investigation. So there's an activist component. And it's also a bottom up approach, which is not that much oriented towards um, uh, public public policy. And well, as Andy said, the most familiar is normally the most problematic, which we're not seeing. Well, I would like to share with you some anti-method thoughts and question, well, the term of methods. Well, first, I, I would like to share with you an experience. In 2018, we organized here in the region of Jalapa, Mexico, something we called Giras de Aprendizaje, transformative learning tours, which could be described as a method of exchange with a peasant to peasant approach in the field with um, approaches of systematization of the experience in the field. And well, as usually time was very short, also time was very short because we perfectly planned all the details of this tour and with different points of participatory methods, trying to balance power relations. And well, suddenly in the middle of the forest with an agroecological coffee production, it started to rain. So what could have been a disaster from a methods point of view was actually in this case, the beginning of a profound encounter and a network of solidarity economics. So we found refuge under a small shelter where we had a spontaneous and very deep dialogue about the problems. And we also dreamed together on how it could work in a different way. 
And what is what was happening there is what we call in Spanish experiencia, an experience. What is this? An unpredictable, unrepeatable event, an encounter between sub subjectivities. And this is what, what happens to us, an openness to the otherness, to a journey and um, to which we give ourselves, but where we do not know what comes out. This is how Laros defines it. So in contrast, methods commonly refer to a path, to a series of steps in order to reach a specific result or end, which in the co conventional sustainability science is linked to knowledge capable of solving big real world problems. So especially the participatory methods are supposed or are meant to be able to contribute to transformation. Um, but what is transformation about? It is about changes from the root, changes that we are usually not able to induce by ourselves, but that arise in an encounter with the otherness. So to say, with something totally different, disruptive, challenging, something that we are normally cannot plan to happen. So when we seek to have control over a process, preventing the uncertain, for example, the rain to, to start, um, uh, to emerge and subjecting it to a technical causality, experience become an experiment. We predefine sequences of events or a safe path. That means participatory methodologies are understood as tools to achieve a certain anticip anticipated end with fixed steps, tend to confine the process to something controllable, limiting the possibilities of encounter and hindering the possibility of transformation of power relations. So at the same time, if we leave the process flowing without any political sensitive guidance, it is likely that also societal vices will be reinforced, hampering active participation of diverse people in reflection and action. So it's a matter of finding balance, of cultivating, as we, we as they were dialoguing in Mexico, of cultivating the conditions for the process to become a transformative experience without ignoring the key micropolitical inertia and attempting to control it. This means facilitating conditions and principles that allow openness to the otherness, to the possible and also to the impossible, where the unexpected can be born in an encounter between people and with nature. So this means transforming ourselves through learning and action requires experiences by which we co-create what we do not know yet, what we do not, uh, what we cannot do yet, and what does not seem possible. Finally, I would like to share with you that for Paulo Freire, um, an important educator and uh, inspiring um, author from Latin America, methods are a way of thinking which is essentially connected to two concepts, curiosity and political commitment. Curiosity is this motor, the sense that inspires our ways of walking driven by questions, the art of making questions and lead our way by these questions. The political commitment refers to the aim. So what is for, why are we, do, why are we wanting to do that? So it's the principles that inspire our ways of walking. How we do things importantly shape the outcome. For example, if my political and epistemological commitment towards a more, is towards a more just and sustainable future, the, measure, the methods may be based on a critical view recognizing power relation and dynamics in a specific territory. So for the methods point, this may imply taking into account cultural actives of self and co-decolonization by local art, spirituality, forms of interaction, or even celebration. Or it may imply that we host human diversity through diverse forms of expression, spanning from drawing, theater, the body, installation, photography. But it also may imply changing our role in opening important decisions on what, why, and how we want to do investigation or action, implying the people, um, especially the ones that are normally heard less. So in the sense of Paulo Freire, each educator is a method. We as facilitators, as research, researchers are methods. Our forms of construction collectively knowledge and action is directly linked to our subjectivities and our personalities, our ways of creating relationships with the others. So our task is to find our own path and form of walking, 
based on curiosity and based on our political commitment. So this is an invitation to change the perspective of isolated methods and tools to a collaborative processes shaped by experiences, encounters between people and with nature, shaped by relations, including power relations, actions, and possibilities of collective transformation. The experiences of others based on methods can inspire us, but we have to invent our own methods, our own passes for each process, live the creative process together with the people we are collaborating with. So this is an invitation to understand methods as a creative process. Convert ourselves and artists who seek to generate the conditions that enable transformative experiences. So I will leave this, this first kick off here and thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Lonnie. Thank you. And thanks. Uh, yeah, a lot of really rich thoughts there. Thanks for bringing in that really important tradition of action research and also for taking a pop at the whole idea of methods. I think that's a really important uh, thing to do. So great stuff. Uh, Dylan, please, I'm really looking forward to what your own experience coming out of transgressive learning. Yes, thank you so much. And thanks to everyone. I'm gonna just let a video play quietly in the background behind me while I speak, mainly because although I'm here speaking today, everyone you're seeing in this video of our people we've worked with for the last eight years and all our different teams who have taught me so much of what I'm gonna be sharing today. Um, so I'm sharing images from Empathyater, which is um, a theater company we've been running for the last uh, eight years that's been really thinking about um, opening up and creating amphitheaters of empathy and building and understanding empathy in, in kind of thick transformation processes in South Africa. And um, so my first point really is to say that, um, and again, agree so much with what you've both said, uh, that what we're, my, my friend in Jara Kalundu says that what we're really interested in is trying to find ways in which people's souls can show up like create a landing strip for the soul. If we can begin by doing work where people can arrive in their fullness, then we can really start working towards building transformation. So within that, what that means for us with regards to methods is that um, we, we've become very interested in kind of allowing and creating the ways that, are, that, that allow for practical wisdoms to emerge. So people's own inner practical lived embodied wisdoms to come into the conversation and dialogue. So in this case, we found that for us, all our methods somehow sit between storytelling and story listening. And, and really what we are very, very interested in is dialogue. And so if I could like have one method that, or one image, let's say, that describes the kind of method that we are engaged in and has been useful for us in uh, transformations towards sustainability, it very much has been this idea of almost echolocation. So I don't know if you are aware of like bats and dolphins, they have this incredible ability to send out a sound, it bounces off the world, it comes back to them, and they're able to locate themselves and move through tricky and difficult territories and, and, and worlds. That's very much um, what I've learned in, and my community of uh, family of practice has learned is really about how do we build this capacity for echolocation. So there's a few things for me that really sit at that. One is um, an ability to actively listen, that listening in itself is the ultimate method in the sense that we are not trying to, uh, it, that listening often is a passive act. Well, we, we often listen passively, but, but we need to be listening actively. And by that, I mean really trying to meet those that we're working with um, in the world that they're working with. So some practical things come down to talking in the, uh, speaking in vernacular languages, keeping things in the context and the, and the ontology and epistemology or the worldviews or cosmovisions that, um, that this knowledge is sitting in. Um, the, the thing is to listen for not what's just the content of what's being said in this dialogue and this exchange, but also the, the feeling um, and the, uh, the impulse or the place from which that, that you can listen to that, that, that idea or concept is coming from. This kind of more nuanced understanding of dialogue and, and, and call and response, as Njara calls it, 
um, has helped us immensely, no matter what the context. So what you're seeing here is footage from projects that are looking at uh, street level drug addiction to um, ocean decision making and sustainability issues around ocean decision making to um, facilitating the um, um, helping um, migrant women coming into Africa. It, it often doesn't matter about the context. For us, what we've learned um, that sits at the core is this ongoing iterative call and response. And by iterative, we're saying that you're constantly being able to allow and collaboratively um, make meaning together and shape that meaning as you move forward, much um, in the same way that Lonnie is speaking about the, the participatory action research. I would like to also say that, Andy, I totally agree also that there are, is a kind of languaging that limits our work. And I think if we come back to the core humanness of our ability to, to tell stories and to listen to stories, in that engagement as human beings with other, with, 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 each, with, with each other, sits the core work of transformation towards sustainability. We're much more leaning towards telling stories and we have to build better methods and better approaches to listening to stories and, and seeing how that can change in our lives. Um, two other things I wanted to quickly say was, um, uh, what I learned as a researcher facilitating this work and researching the pedagogies or the learning practices that help us develop transgressive learning um, is not so much for the method, but the, the kind of um, the qualities and the principles of this work sometimes often are more useful for me and, and for my students and for people I work with in the field. And that comes down to um, a different kind of rigor. We're trained to, to have an academic rigor where we are, and I, I, I'm very grateful to um, uh, Lena Weber and, okay, so that's, let me just stop sharing there. Um, Lena Web, Weber and, uh, mine's just, the name's just gone out of my head, but I'm grateful to this concept of political rigor, this idea that we need to think um, of the political ramifications of the activities we are do, we're working in. Um, and so uh, this uh, practice of, of carefully thinking through our role, our power, um, and, and having um, a, a reflexive or an ability to co constantly reflect on our impact on how we are practicing our work um, sits at that, that kind of empathy development or that idea of um, practicing living, listening empathy. So, um, I'm sticking away also from the concept of method and like Lonnie also believe in a kind of anti-method approach in the sense that they, um, when we come to ethics, there are two wings of a bird. On the one side is the moral imperatives or the rules that we've kind of set up and established for how we can ensure our methods or our practices don't cause harm. And those are important. Um, but we have to be very aware that those have been developed in a particular kind of institution and in a particular kind of social contract. We have to move beyond that. And the other wing of the bird is building a moral intuition. Um, this comes from a concept by Rudolf Steiner, but simply put, this is just thinking about how do we intuitively engage with what feels right and what feels wrong. So how, when I say it started with, um, how do we allow our souls to show up and, and bring people's full being into the space? Often when you allow your own soul to show up and you come into the work as a fully integrated um, person and, you, and you're able to hold and claim that space as yourself, you're often able to work in a more intuitive way and um, morally intuitive way. So maybe that's a little bit um, esoteric, but I feel like um, what has been most useful in my career and in my practice is thinking about these things in a much more human and accessible way. Um, and then, um, yeah, I've got a few more kind of very simple ideas of what to think about when thinking about your methods, but I might leave it at, um, at that ritual about timing. Maybe Andy, you Great. can come in. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks Dylan, that was wonderful. Yeah, please do come back with those thoughts. We'll have, have several little place where we come back to that. But those are really great thoughts. So it's embodiment, that listening, the echo location metaphor I really love. So thank you both Lonnie and Dylan for that. Um, let, I, I've got a little question actually for each of you, but um, I, what I want to encourage before I just ask that is uh, if everybody could just, if you've got something bubbling up, if you feel a thought bubbling up, uh, something that's been missed out, something really important that needs to be said, maybe a concern or a, a criticism of, of something that uh, 
has been raised in the uh, this uh, opening discussion, please put it into the chat box and we'll use that. We'll look among those and, and kick off the, uh, the chat storm on that basis. So please get the old neurons going uh, there and uh, notwithstanding the embodiment and it's not all about knowledge. Um, but yeah, one of the things I really got from what you've both said, Lonnie and Dylan, is it's not just the stories you're telling, which are really engaging about what this kind of uh, quite challenging ideas of research can can give us. It's not just a story, it's the way you told it. It was that kind of humility. It was acknowledging the messiness. You know, the rain example, Lonnie, and you're using that video nicely just to show these processes in, in action, just to remind us, uh, Dylan. So I just wanna, how, and this is something that Rose and Marina have been really focusing on and colleagues and, and, and Joel and Charlie and Patty through this year and the Steps Methods year is, is bringing this messiness to light, you know, being making people feel they're able to acknowledge failures in our own work as as researcher activists as well as um, uh, in our other roles. So I don't know if you've got any reflections on that humility about mess, um, either of you. Yes, or just leave, I can, leave no, me with I the can hop, I, can hop, <laughs> I can hop into messiness. Um, Thanks. I'm, I'm a big, sorry, my dog is trying to sit next to me here. Um, I, <laughs> there you I go. Really, um, I advocate for more messier approaches. Um, one in particularly around one of the biggest things that I think we, we realize we have to do in, in transformations work, transgressive or transdisciplinary work, is we have to challenge normative kind of strong narratives. And often I found the most useful work we can do is make messy those um, taken for granted narratives. So any ways in which we can do that are useful and they often are quite messy. Um, so I'll, I'll give an example. We worked for a very long time with trying to change the ways in which the police were, were um, policing drugs in, 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 in South Africa, which were very violent and aggressive. Um, the kind of solution to that was not clearly seen over time, but what needed to happen was a constant dialogue and just opening up a space between those who are very vulnerable and those who had power. So here we weren't so interested in the pedagogy of a, uh, the oppressed, but more of the oppressors. And in that, that process, we had to kind of intuitively slowly work with um, and make messy the kind of standard procedures and ideas and concepts that were sitting in the kind of powerful space. And that, that process, can't, you can't clearly see what's needed um, at first glance. You have to kind of engage with these narratives one by one and bit by bit and kind of make, make them messy as you go along. Um, the other thing is yeah. we, are, we are dealing with a hot mess. I mean, if you think of the triple C threat, threat crisis of COVID, climate change and capitalism, that, that is like the definition of a hot mess. So there's no clean way that you can deal and respond to something as hot and messy as the situation we're in now. So, so you know, in the same way, we need to kind of be able to respond in a much more organic, uh, uh, responsive, uh, we, we literally try to respond to a constantly moving and changing and shifting target. So I think yeah. Um, yeah. being able to be responsive right. in that way is really important. Yeah. So maybe I would say messiness could be replaced with kind of a responsiveness and mm. empathetic responsiveness maybe might be more useful. Yeah. Thanks, Dylan. That's the, yeah, great. Uh, Lonnie. Yeah, it was also, well, my first thought was, why, why are you thinking this is messiness? <laughs> <laughs> I, I did not found any methy in it. Um, I just found it natural. Um, for example, living here in the in the cloud uh, foggy forest, um, you you start to understand that forest is not a, a clear ordered thing, but nature is is this kind of diversity, mixed, complex, um, which maybe from a from an occidental point of view seems to be messy <laughs> seems to be not ordered there are too much elements they they move in a way you cannot understand but finally this is nature so so i and un i understand it more that um we we just permit nature to be we permit ourselves to be natural and maybe this is connected to the the other word you bring up which is humility um, which I think maybe it's the most important starting point. 
um, those processes which are finally relations. So we start relations of collaboration with, with other people. Um, and maybe the, the most important starting point is to, to see ourselves as human connecting, internet, interacting with other humans um, without thinking of methods, concepts, what did you study, just the, the most basic thing. We're creating relations with other humans in order to do something together. And the something together can be resolve a problem, but can also be reach an utopia, reach a, a, a dream we are connected to, to each other. So the, the important thing, I, I guess, or an important starting point is the humility. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lonnie. That's great. Uh, I'm already, uh, these things are so much better discussed in a pub somewhere, I think, or in a bar or a <laughs> out on a veranda. Um, thank you so much. That, that, that's great. A nice corrective to uh, some of the way I put the point there. So I'm seeing lots of really great uh, comments and questions bubbling up now. Um, and please take a look at the chat and we'll funnel these things in to the, uh, to the uh, breakout sessions we're going to join uh, shortly. But let's have a go now at the chat storm idea. So the idea is, remember, I'll, I'll pick one initially and that will get the ball rolling. And then if you could remember to just say what it is you'd like to say as briefly as possible and then hand over to another chat that you've seen that's caught your eye uh, that maybe have some kind of connection uh, uh, or, or some sort of thick spark something in your mind. So let's give it a whirl. Um, and just one of the very early ones that's cropped up, uh, which struck me, especially given the mention in our own talks of experimentation, is uh, David Manuel Navarre raided an issue about control and about the dangers attached to control ideas. Um, so David, if you'd like to uh, activate your microphone and uh, tell us a bit more about that and then pass on the bat to someone else, please. Hi, hi everyone. Well, I was uh, I was re reflecting on this contrast between um, method as a mechanism of, con of controlling reality or, or a situation versus experience and engaging. Experience re requires fully engaging. And I was thinking uh, what part of ourselves is engaging when we engage in methods? And the part of ourselves that came to mind was this uh, male dominating uh, ego, right? That, uh, that uh, you know, has a, so I, I guess that, that was the thought. I don't know whether they can pick up on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, and could you pick up a chat point you'd like to pass on to, David? Um, uh, let me. There was um, this idea about uh, intuition, the um, ethical intuition, and, and how there was this this question about how how can we cultivate that in in us, and uh, and it's, it cannot be taught, I guess, <laughs> in a formal way, or or it can, I don't know, uh, but yeah, that that was a comment that picked up my my mind. Could you identify the person's name from the chat? Almendra. 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 Great. Hi. Uh, hi. Well, no, I, it was like a catharsis, <laughs> catharsis moment because I, I, I feel really overwhelmed by that, but by that uh, idea. I mean, I know there isn't a methodological answer of how to, <laughs> but how to cultivate, as David was saying, how to cultivate that. I mean, it's not a natural skill that that some of us have, especially those that are born and educated in a context of uh, academia and the uh, deadlines and and those who still practice or, or practice or work in that context, how to deal with those pressures and at the same time build so profound skills. And, and not only because we don't have only the responsibility to build them in ourselves, but to foster them as a collective. So I know there isn't a method, but how or, or what we can do, what can we do? Great, thank you so much. And please pass on. Could you pick another chat, uh, Almendra, that you see? Yes, that yes, your eye? sure. Yeah, um, I, there, there was a conversation about messiness that Halley was um, mentioning. Halley Aiken. Otherwise, also, Geisha yeah. Sanchez was uh, talking to Halley about this messiness concept. Uh, Halley says that she can get it to work. 
Uh, hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah. So I think I can understand like the point of view why some people find it messy because like coming from like a nat natural science perspective, we're used to like methods that are really like hard methods that are you know you can follow and um, adjusting from that field to a like social science field, which is more often sometimes. Um, based on my experience, sometimes it's kind of uncomfortable because there's that uncertainty that what to do next, something like that, how do I process this data, those kinds of things. So um, coming from that space to this, un other uh, uh, to this other space, at my first, um, my first uh, observation is that I find it messy, but listening to more experiences from researchers that are more experienced in this space. Yeah, like what Lonnie said, I can feel that, well, this is like the natural way of research that's supposed to be. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, na there's not necessarily a tension between being natural and in a mess. They are maybe more similar than we, we admit in some of our work. Thank you so much. Um, who would you like to pass on to? Um, let me check. So, um, there is a... A comment by Kinga um, saying that like uh, a reflexive research diary to develop moral intuition like that's something I'm uh, I'm still new to that idea like how um, if people have experience doing that how effective is it like how do you um, balance the reflexivity in your research to like you know, like that more um, practical thing that you need to do. But, um, yeah, I, I guess I guess I can hop on that and explain a bit. Um, so I'm new to qualitative methods and basically that's what I got into the idea of this reflective diary. Um, because to help myself basically re reflect on my own biases and um, the process. Um, and I think it can really help to develop this moral intuition because you, you basically have to practice it every day um, when you have to really justify to yourself every decision that you make and um, think about uh, how this affects the process and therefore how it's gonna affect the, your research outcome. So, um, and the practicality of it for me is basically to, at the end of my busy day, just take a notebook and reflect on what happened. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been so far, it's really open process for me. So I guess there is no recipe for how to do it right. I just reflect on important things and uh, that's what's important for me. And um, yeah, and really try to go into deeper levels and so not just summarize what I did, but really why I did it and what, what does it mean for the next steps. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I think we've got time. These are great. This is a great way of uh, opening up different thoughts. Please pick another. I think we've got room just for one more reflection. So your responsibility is pick the last chat that we talk about for the moment. Yeah. So I so because we've been talking about this more and again we're going back to the moral <laughs> intuition and I saw Adriana mention also that she would add principles such as reciprocity, relationality, and complementarity. So I'm wondering um, if she can elaborate on that a little bit more. Can you hear me? That's much better. Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. What uh, I have been learning in my research process, it's uh, and uh, what I mentioned did about uh, reciprocity and uh, complementarity and relationality. I learned from indigenous people from Bolivia, what I'm working with, and uh, they taught me uh, how important it is is to learn to be reciprocal and it is not only uh, from in Andean people of uh, Bolivia but uh, I saw that most of the indigenous people are based on those kind of ethical principles if we want to to learn to, to do different things we need to learn to be how to be relational and how to be reciprocal with with others and 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 it is part of uh, 
of the way how we we build our relationships and then um it is it is very close to what uh, dylan and Loni were, were saying about uh of of how we establish the dialogues and uh, ethics and uh, how we can just learn to to be with the others in a deep listening and in in in, in being responsible and uh, for ourselves and in the relation with the others wonderful thank you yeah that point about relationality is absolutely key i think thank you for really highlighting it well i we're, we're running out of time sadly there's been a lot of really great comments sadly we've not had a chance to get to but everyone's seen them let's feed them into the parallel sessions but lonnie or 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 dylan do you have any quick reflections on anything that's been said uh in in this little chat storm uh yeah, I'll just quickly then to just say, um, I hear you, Amendra, about how, how hard the moral intuition work is, but um, the, you're never in this work alone. And that's, I think, what's so important about any kind of transformations work. If you find yourself utterly alone, then something's wrong. Um, you, you, this work cannot be done on your own. It has to be collaborative. And kind of the moral intuition emerges through those relationships. So, I mean, what I've learned is to build lots of kind of communities of like critical friends that when I, I'm coming to situations that I'm finding difficult or tricky, or if the, the kind of method I might have gone to with in the past is not working, I have people to rely on and to call on to get that call and response, to get something to help me through that. Um, I, I've realized that ever since my like early postgraduate, I, I realized I couldn't work alone in, in transformations work. It has to be together. And so that moral intuition actually starts rapidly emerging when you're working with others around these questions. And like Lonnie said, when the rain falls and you hide under the, together under the rain and build new solidarity, like it's in those little, little nooks and crannies between things that the moral intuition really starts emerging and like yep. lubricates the social tissue that you're trying to build so or grows the social tissue so i think yeah. um and then the final point is that we will no matter who you're engaging with someone has experienced care in their lives because we're all born as these vulnerable babies and have to be cared for and so we've learned uh, at least the basics of what moral intuition looks like because our parents don't know how to raise us and or whoever raised us our grandparents or our guardians they have to learn as they're going and it's in many ways it's that same thing that 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 drives and builds our moral intuition yeah. i don't know if that makes sense yeah. but i was uh, just thank you great dylan thank you so much uh Lon Lonnie. yeah i would like to first uh, there was a question in the chat on on how you can apply it for grants <laughs> with this um unclear approach where you do not have the results from the beginning. Mm, I think this this have been one of the, the biggest challenges or problems that we're so stuck to, to a model of how we finance, how we organize, that it's difficult to transform ourselves. Um, so I think the changes are more deep. So you don't, the, the idea now is not to think, how can I, I get the money in order to do this? Just do it. And then the money will transform and come also. Um, that is well mainly how we experience to do it. So it's not about um, getting money for a project and then do it. Just do collaborative processes, start to engage with others and to plan together what would be important for us to do, what do we want to do. Um, and come, well, on, on the way you're working and you're walking together, um, normally financing does appear somehow. <laughs> Sounds strange, but maybe it's it's linked to the to the idea of reciprocality and also to the idea of the intuition. So maybe yeah. just we, we just need to try it. Maybe it's one of those bio, um, barriers we have only in our mind and not are so important or real that we have to to just stop here. And to the question on how we can cultivate empathy and care in context of brutal power, I think from the feminist movements here in Mexico, we learned that the only answer to brutal power, to violence, is solidarity, tenderness, empathy, and collective care. 
Um, so it's just in this context where we can learn to do it because there's no other way possible. There's no other way to, to stack out of this frustrating, violent situations than doing it in a very, well, solidarity way, yeah. reconnecting from, from love, from tenderness. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, finally, I, I think to the idea of cultivating moral institution, um, I think the, the monetization is just let guide you and your collective, so collectively let guide you by the experience. So normally the experience is, is telling you where you have to go. Um, it's just a part of attentive listening and listening together, not only um, one person decides where to go. We have to, to learn to decide collectively, to hear collectively and to also cultivate a collective intuition, not only an individual one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lonnie. Thanks, Dylan. I found that really inspiring, actually. I think it's a great way to set up the discussions, which we now move over to, where we're going to have this thread all the same uh, lines back in again, but in the context of particular methods. So. Uh, uh, Marina, I think it's over to you.